Well, just because you agree on the index doesn't necessarily mean you agree on the indexing approach. And today's ETF battle is a contest of colliding strategies linked to the S&P 500. It's the Invesco S&P 500 equal weight ETF, that's RSP, going up against the Spider S&P 500 ETF, SPY. So which is better? Find out right after this. Welcome to ETF Battles. I'm Ron DeLegge. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on our channel and also press the like button if you've been enjoying our content. If you have a certain ETF battle matchup that you'd like to see, visit the comment section below and give us your ETF tickers. You can also hit our Twitter feed at ETF Guide. And uh, if your ETF battle is selected, well, guess what? You're going to win your choice of an ETF Battles coffee mug or a shirt. So make it good. To me, today's ETF contest is a battle of granddaddy versus grandpappy. And SPY being the first U.S. listed ETF is certainly the granddaddy, while RSP being the first equal weight index ETF is the grandpappy. And both fund launches were major milestones have brought the ETF industry to where it's at today. Helping us to judge today's skirmish is Eric Paul Chunis with Bloomberg and Dave Natick with ETF Trends. Guys, welcome back. Great to see you. Great to be here, Ron. Thanks for having us. Excellent. So we've got our four battle categories. By the way, Ron, come on. Yes. Aren't you going to comment on my shirt? Oh, yes. Look at that. Your, your attire is perfect. See? You're perfectly adorned team, for today's I'm a team, program. I'm a team player, Ron. You sure are. Thank you so much for representing. By the way, for our audience, we do have a ETF battle store. So be sure to visit it. We've got the sweatshirts, we've got t-shirts, and of course, coffee mugs. So uh, again, uh, thanks, thanks, Eric, for, for representing. So um, our four battle categories are cost, exposure, strategy, performance, and the mystery category, where our judges can pick that single factor or multiple factors to make their final uh, assessment of today's showdown. So we're going to begin with cost, and I, I've got the scorekeeping duties. By the way, I should mention that none of the battle outcomes are ever known in advance by myself or the judges, nor are they predetermined. So we'll begin with the first category, which is cost. Dave, please get us started. Yeah, so this is a pretty straightforward one. Um, you know, SPY is what, 945? It's not even nine basis points anymore. It's just a little bit off. 9.45%. Uh, RSP is 20 basis points. So on a raw cost basis, of course, RSP is going to look worse. SPY is also the most liquidly traded security in the world. So you don't really ever have to worry about the spreads there. It's one of the only securities I think I could ever say you could confidently put market orders in and probably not get hosed. RSP, you have to be a little bit more careful. RSP has actually been one of those securities that when we've had weird little flash crashes in the market, sometimes it trades a little bit weird. So you have to approach it a little bit more cleanly than you might something like SPY. So SPY definitely just went hands down on cost. Although I'd point out it's not even the cheapest way to get large cap exposure. You can get that free or a couple basis points in a lot of places. Thank you, Dave. That's a strong start. Eric, how do you see it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously SPY is half the cost, but these have two different exposures. So um, RSP is 20 basis points, but it used to be 40. Um, it's actually an interesting story. Goldman filed for an equal weighted ETF about five years ago. And since they had just undercut smart bait, I think the people at Guggenheim at the time were like, we're not going to let them come in and undercut us. So they, they self-cannibalized. And it was already the number one product in the category. That's how brutal the ETF industry is. Um, you know, you got to do that Steve Jobs rule of, of cannibalizing yourself before someone else does. By doing that, though, now that RSP had a good year this year, it kind of came back. It became in vogue. It got all the flows. Goldman's got nothing. So it really worked. So anyway, I'm going to go RSP because for that type of exposure, 20 bips is very cheap uh, versus nine for – the S&P 500, you should get that three times cheaper. So I'm going to go relativity on this <laughs> and go with RSP uh, at 20 being the better deal. They're both, and they both traded a penny spread, so that's a moot point. Next up is exposure strategy. So Eric, you're still up. Uh, slice it down for us. Yeah, um, this is an interesting question because obviously when you equal weight the S&P, um, you, which I basically, I, I compare these two like, uh, like I compare Congress. <laughs> So the S&P 500 is like the House of Representatives, and RSP is like the Senate. 
So I think some people just like the idea of the Senate where every state's equal. That's that. So I think philosophically, RSP can just, you know, kind of like ma- in, match up with your feeling. I, when I go to do the money show with retail investors, I get asked equal weighting almost more than any other strategy. I think regular people just identify with, shouldn't every stock get an equal weighting? I want to bet on all the horses, but market cap has done a lot better in the past 10 years. When you look forward though, the question is, you know, do you think that small caps, which have lagged a long time and mid caps uh, might have a nice rebound? Do you think value might come back? Is, are we going to see a regime change? Uh, equal weighting, I think, will do a little better than S&P 500 in a regime change. And it looked like that was going to happen in the first quarter. Um, value in small caps did good. Um, that's part of the reopening trade. Um, but it kind of went away. <laughs> and and right, we're right back to this like large cap growth thing. So I think I, I like the holdings of RSP a little better for the next 10 years, simply because I've seen regimes change. In fact, in the 2000s, the S&P was flat and small value was like crushing it. So I think we're kind of due for a regime change, and that's why I'd like the holdings better for RSP. But clearly, this is complicated because they track different indexes. Very good. Thank you, Eric. And we're going to shift now to Dave in terms of exposure strategy. How do you see it? I'm a big fan of RSP. I like equal weighting. I think most people are far too weighted heavily in the largest stocks in the in the indexes overall, um, whether you're in SPY or whether you just look at your total portfolio. I think people are often surprised how much Google, Amazon, Facebook they have kicking around in their portfolios. RSP is a salve for that problem. Uh, I've, I've been a fan of this product since it launched, so I'm going to keep sticking to my guns here. I think RSP has got a better approach to the market. Thank you very much, Dave. Now we shift to performance. So this is where it gets really interesting. And and both of these ETFs have a pretty long performance history. So Dave, you're still up. Uh, Give us your insight. Yeah. So Eric mentioned that, you know, RSP is something that sort of goes through phases, right? When you see that move towards small cap value, which tends to be the rotation we talk about, RSP is going to outperform because it really overweights those mid caps at the bottom of the S&P 500. Um, now, year to date, that actually has worked in RSP's benefit. It's up about 3% over the straight up S&P 500. But I think the Eric's point, you, you should not expect this to be an all weather outperformer. That's not really what you're doing here. What you're doing is getting a better diversified portfolio. So you're going to get a slightly lower beta over time and pretty S&P like performance. It's a nice tweak for a lot of portfolios. I give the edge here to RSP with a few caveats. Thank you, Dave. Eric, how do you see it in terms of a performance between SPY and RSP? So it's interesting. RSP is arguably the first ever smart beta ETF. Uh, launched in 2003, way ahead of its time, way before that term was even out, I think. Um, and That's when it was called fundamental indexing. Yes, before smart beta came and became like a, the worst term ever of you know, people like hated it, and but yet it stuck. I was like, "Hey, man, it look, it, it's here to stay." Anyway, um, the performance since it came out, you'll be shocked. It's it's up six hundred seventy four percent. That's a hundred percentage points better than S and P. Now, the the thing with the performance though is that the mid cap index for the S and P IJH, which is the ETF that tracks mid caps, is six seventy two. So you kind of pretty much track mid caps which kind of makes sense, right? If you're equal weighted, you're kind of going more to that middle area. Um, So the question is, did you really get alpha or did you just get mid cap beta? Uh, I think you got to caveat that, but look, I got to give it to RSP because it's winning over the long haul. And those are several cycles and year to date it's up. Um, But if you go like the past 10 years, um, that's where it has, it has lagged, but only by 37 percentage points, not a ton. That takes us to the mystery battle category, where our judges can pick that single factor or multiple factors to make their persuasive arguments. So, Eric, uh, give us your mystery battle category. What is it and who wins it? My mystery battle category is is an underrated ETF metric, which is rebalancing frequency. Um, I think, you know, here's a case where when you're equal weighted, you have this sort of thing going on where, you know, you, you... as stocks start to do better, they get a uh, bigger weighting. And is, as the rebalancing hits, you've got to sell some of those ones that have won and buy some of the ones that haven't done better to, to recalibrate to equal. So you're buying winners, you're selling winners and buying losers. That is sometimes called discipline rebalancing. 
And I think that really connects with people. They can understand that process. Arc does it. That's why she tell, sells Tesla and everybody thinks she's bearish. But no, she's just trying to get Tesla back to 11% because this the ETF's so hot. Most people rebalance with the 60-40. If the 60 gets to 70, they rebalance. This is really good discipline rebalancing like most people are used to. If anything, SPY is more like a momentum rebalancing in a way. So I kind of think that's an interesting mystery category here. And why I think, I haven't dug into it, but why RSP doesn't tend to, to lag as much when SPY does really well. That gives it a little extra something uh, that helps it from lagging too much. Very good. Thank you very much, Eric. I got you down for RSP for your mystery category. And Dave, you're up next. What is your mystery battle category and who wins it? Uh, so I'm going to just go with toolkit as a category. Like how how useful is one of these funds in a portfolio? Um, honestly, I, I I pick RSP here for that the same reasons. Part of the issue is I don't even think SPY is a particularly great way to get U.S. large cap exposure. There are so many other ways to do this. You know, something like J.P. Morgan's Beta Builder U.S. is two basis points, and you're going to get pretty great broad U.S. indexed exposure. So there are a lot of ways to skin that cat. RSP. What's the ticker on that one? The Beta Builders U.S. BBUS. BBUS. Got it. Thank you very much. Continue. It's at two basis points. You're getting a broad market exposure. It tracks, I think, a Morningstar a broad market index for the U.S. Um, you know, part of a suite of products they have there that are super, super cheap. Um, so I, I genuinely don't like SPY even for what it's designed for. So I'm just going to give this to RSP. I think it's a better tool in the toolbox. Thank you very much, Dave. Now the final chance for our judges to weigh in with their overall battle winner. Dave, give it to us. Well, I want to get a wild card in, which I think I stole from Eric when we were talking earlier, which is reverse the arrow reverse cap weighted ETF. It's the same 500 stocks. It just does the opposite of what the S&P 500 does. So whatever the biggest stock in the S&P is right now, I think it's Apple, right, um, will be the lowest weighted stock in RVRS. Uh, I think it's a really interesting approach. It's about 29 basis points, which is probably too expensive. It's actually managed to outperform both the S&P 500 and RSP over the last year. It's a really interesting way of tweaking an existing set of allocations. Nobody's going to just dump all of their portfolios and put them into any one ETF. Adding a little RVRS really gets you that mid-cap skew. Again, on a toolkit basis, I think that's a really interesting add. But overall, from the ones we're picking from, RSP is the winner. Thank you, Dave. Eric, your final chance to weigh in. Give it to us. Yeah, I, I like RSP. It's, it's hard to not like the S&P 500. That thing has just proven people wrong for like decades. It's just a powerhouse. I get it. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just, in this climate, after the incredible run it's had, I, it just feels like RSP is kind of like due for its, you know, 10 years of, of regime. Um, and I also like the concept of equal weighting. Um, I, I like that idea of selling some winners now and then and buying some losers over and over and hoping that that kind of like, it's like collecting little, uh, little acorns, you know, and, um, so that, that's why I'm going to give it to RSP for those two reasons. And it's, it's, if it were 40 bips, that might be an issue, but now it's 20, which is, that's almost, I consider that dirt cheap or at least cheap. Um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. I think um, also the uh, sectors allocation, which we, I think we indirectly touched on, this has about, I think, half as much tech. Um, and the, the idea, like if you own theme ETFs or you invest in other kinds of ETFs, you're probably way overexposed to tech and those fang names anyway. So I like this sort of as potentially like a sharing the portfolio with, with a SPY or a VTI, um, you know, maybe not replacing it, but I, I kind of like the idea of, of using this in that regards. And RVRS, actually, you'd need less of RVRS to do what we're doing with RSP. So that's a, that's a, I agree with that too. And uh, that's an interesting product. Well, thank you, judges, for your insightful analysis. And according to my scorecard, today's battle winner is RSP, and it uh, it won on all categories, with the exception of cost. Dave chose SPY, but um, in all the other categories, RSP was favored. And we also had R RVRS as the wild card pick. Dave uh, shared that one with us, and Eric agreed. So uh, that's also one to keep on your radar screen. And a couple of key takeaways, you know, if smaller stocks and our judges hit on this, but if smaller stocks are going to outperform, then you go with RSP and its weighting strategy with the expectation that over a long enough time horizon that those smaller companies are going to grow faster. 
versus the larger already mature companies. And that should certainly give RSP a performance advantage if that plays out. SPY is still the safer, more mainstream choice, but it might not even be the best choice anymore because as pointed out, there are certainly lower cost S&P 500 uh, alternatives out there like SPLG, IVV, and certainly um, if you're looking for exposure to the large cap U.S. space, you know, keep your eye on other ETFs as mentioned uh, by Dave BBUS. So great job, Eric and Dave, for helping us to break down today's matchup. It was great. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks, Ron. So which ETF battles would you like to see in our upcoming episodes? Post your ETF ticker symbols in the YouTube comment section below. You can also find us on Twitter, at ETF Guide. If we choose your battle, you'll win your choice of an ETF battles mug or a t-shirt. So make it good. Thanks for watching. I'm Ron DeLegge with ETF Guide TV. We'll see you next time. <laughs>